and thank you everybody for taking the time to join us uh, to talk a little bit about Mesh Radio. Um, one of the things that I think, uh, I've been working with AES doing training for the last couple of years, and I think one of the more most misunderstood portions of uh, working with this technology is the antenna selection. But first I wanna just go over a little bit about mesh radio technology. Uh, it's a unique way of sending alarm signals using narrow band VHF or UHF radio uh, packet data. Um, we do uh, fall under NFPA uh, 72 chapter 266332. This is the 2013 version, so it might be a little outdated, but governs all one-way private radio and uh, this is what mesh networks fall under. Um, so the beauty of mesh networks is that every radio is a repeater. Everything is supervised two ways. Multiple pathways is one of the real key features of a mesh radio network. Once you have enough subscribe, we call them subscribers or radios out there, it really provides a robust way of getting your signals back to the central station. And one way it does this is it self-manages and heals the network. So if one radio gets taken out, it will reroute to the next radio available. Um, the, one of the beauty parts about this uh, is there's no outside phone or data connection required. Anybody going out there and replacing the 3G modems with the 4G modems uh, will know the benefit of that. And of course, with everything fire, there's no single point of failure. Um, just a brief highlight of what uh, the AES radio technology is. We have our subscriber right here, and this is an uh, this is the, what, most people, what, what most people call the radio. Uh, this is our AES subscriber. And the signals will hop between subscriber and subscriber until they get back to the IP link. And what the IP link does is it will change uh, the radio data into IP data and then send it along to the receiver. Okay, and this is what's gonna be located at the dispatch center and being monitored by the alarm automation software. We also have our transceiver. This is actually what generates the radio signal within the subscriber. Um, just so you know, every one of these needs to be tuned to a specific frequency. And these are generally, uh, with mesh radio networks, they are low wattage, ra uh, low wattage transceivers. You can see here, this is two watts. Our IP link um, is two and a half watts. Very, very small amounts of power. Okay, and one of the things that it took me a while to get my wrap my head around with this mesh alarm concept is we don't want the signals to go too far, okay? Um, we don't wanna turn this into a tower system where all of these subscribers are just uh, talking directly to the IP links, okay? We want them to hop back and forth because if the radio signal goes too far, what it does is it overshoots the ability of that little two watt radio to do its job. Okay, so here we have um, a very small mesh radio network. And how it works is we have our fire subscriber and this will connect to a Berg subscriber. There's nothing in code that says a fire signal can't go through a Berg subscriber. And it will hop from subscriber to subscriber to subscriber until it gets back to our IP link. And once it gets to the IP link, it'll go to the internet and then our receiver at the dispatch center. Now. The beauty part about this is if we take D out of the way here, right? Somebody, a customer decides they don't want uh, alarm service anymore. They take it out. It's all of the subscribers still have two uh, communication paths. Okay, so we can, all of them will still communicate um, and have two separate paths to communicate back. Okay, so now that we've gotten a little bit of that out of the way, um, we exist in the 450 to uh, 470 megahertz uh, spectrum right in here with mobile phones, GPS, Wi-Fi, 4G. Um, radio signal travels at the speed of light, not the speed of sound. A lot of people make that mistake and I, I understand why, um, but it's 186,000 miles per second, okay? So it is a very, very fast way of getting your signals back to the central station. And actually, if you ever get a chance to attend one of our trainings at a hotel room, we put up some alarm automation software and have you pull the zones. And by the time you can look up from pulling the zone, your signal will be at, uh, displayed on the screen. It is very, very fast. Uh, SCC li license is required. Um, highly recommend that as well. Uh, so we have frequency is, uh, frequency of a radio wave is how 
um, how often this happens. So how often this uh, passes my cursor in a second, one hertz, and then four hertz. Like you said, we're in the 450 to 470 megahertz range. Um, so very, very, well, not too high a frequency, to be honest, in the grand scheme of things. But uh, we exist right here with uh, cell phones, direct TV, some other different things like that. Power in watts is how high and how low the waves go. Okay, so the peak in the trough uh, determines the power, watts, or amplitude. A couple things we really want to avoid with metal is, um, remember, these are two watt radios, right? Two watt radios. So we want to keep as much of that going into the outside world as possible. And this is really um, one of the keys to installing. And uh, it really affects where you want to put your antennas, okay? Because you want to make sure that you have as little interference as possible. Because if you have any sort of interference, what's going to happen is it will either reflect the radio signal, like metal here, and it reflects it right back into it. And remember, all of these subscribers send signals as well as receive signals. So if it bounces off a piece of metal, uh, you know, a foot from your antenna and then goes right back into the antenna, it's not doing anybody any good. So um, keep it away from metal, keep it away from anything that generates electrical arcs, um, and you'll be in good shape. With antennas, for mesh radio networks, I would always recommend using omnidirectional antennas whenever possible. The other thing is, when you're using an omnidirectional antenna, you want to make sure to get it above the building roof line. Now, I've worked with a lot of techs. I know this isn't always 100% um, possible, uh, but it will greatly benefit because you're not entirely sure where your next radio peer is going to be located. Okay, and even, uh, even if you do know exactly where all your subscribers are located, you don't know where it's going to be in the future, okay? So we really want to make sure we send this, the signal as many different directions as possible. Um, if you are going to use a unidirectional antenna or mount your antenna on the side of a building, I would highly recommend making sure it's on the correct side of the building, okay? It's very, very important, and we'll get to uh, some examples in a little bit. So I said antennas are the most misunderstood portion of uh, these radio mesh networks. I think antenna gain is the most misunderstood portion of antennas, okay? Antenna gain does not amplify the signal. Antenna gain focuses the signal. And you can see with our diagram here, the angle that this, uh, the radio uh, signal comes off the antenna, this here is called the beam width. And as you go up in dB, you go down in beam width. Now, uh, so here you can see a 1 dB antenna, and this isn't um, drawn to scale. This is just a cartoon drawing, basically. But our 1 dB antennas basically send the signal 180 degrees. Now, as you go up in dB, we get to our 3 dB antenna, which is about 35 degrees of beam width. You get to 6 dB, it goes to 17 degrees of beam width. If you go to with our 9 dB antenna, which is our highest dB antenna, it's shooting off a signal at 7 degrees, okay? Very, very, it's almost shooting a laser beam out of the side of your antenna, and that's how it gets the distance, okay? Is it, it focuses all of that energy in a very small area, which can be exactly what you need, but what I want to make sure is that a lot of times I find people think a high dB antenna is more power. These are all transmitting at the same amount of power. It just focuses the radio signal. Okay, so the other thing um, we'll talk about in a bit, but as you go up in height of the antenna, you want to go down in dB of the antenna. You can actually get antenna mismatches. And for example, if we put a subscriber or a AES radio down here, uh, below this antenna, below the blue here, we're not going to see any radio signal, okay, because it's literally shooting over the top of the AES subscriber. Conversely, I've seen a lot of antennas mounted horizontally, okay. If you mount the antenna horizontally, you're shooting one set of, uh, one of the signals straight up into the sky, and you're setting one set of signals straight down into the, uh, into the ground, the ultimate insulator. All right, so I, I actually had a guy in one of my trainings say, 
you know, we go around, ask him how many uh, subscribers they installed. He said 2,500. Like, wow. Get to this point of the presentation. He's like, I, I found you can mount them horizontally. And, oh, actually, I apologize. I skipped, screwed it up the story. 2,500 radios. Asked them, well, how has it been? Nothing but trouble. And I was like, oh, that's pretty odd to have installed 2,500 radios and have nothing but trouble. We get to this point in the presentation. He's like, I found you can put them up in the attic. No problem. Just mount them horizontally in the attic. And I was like, weren't you the same guy that 20 minutes ago said you had nothing but problems? And sure enough. Okay. <laughs> so be very careful. Any of the signal that's getting to the next radio pier when the antennas are mounted this way is reflecting off of something. And that is not going to be a very reliable transmission. Here's a great example of um, the antenna gain and beam width that I was talking about. With our lower grade antennas, you send the signal 360 degrees. As you go up in antenna gain, you decrease the distance, but you increase the beam width. I think I said that backwards. Um, you, you, as the beam width goes down, you increase this, the distance of the signal, but we don't want to send large distances. With these mesh radio networks, you should be sending them one to three miles at the most. Okay, there are some rare exceptions, but generally you want to um, keep the distances as short as possible. This is a real life example from uh, a company somewhere in the United States. Um, and I think what happens here is people that are working with AES technology are like, hey, I, we have our IP links, which you know, uh, are, is an investment that the company is going to have to make up front. And what they do is they're like, oh, I'm going to get my friend has access to a 900 foot building, a big skyscraper downtown. I'm going to get the biggest antenna possible and I'll put it on the top of the biggest building possible. And I'm going to cover the whole city in AES radio signal. And then I'll never have to buy additional IP links. It'll be great. The problem is when you put a nine DB antenna on top of a 900 foot building, you have a 2.7 mile dead zone before this signal gets to the ground. Okay. Lowering the antenna, from 900 feet to 250 feet will reduce the dead zone to just over three quarters of a mile. Okay, but 2.7 mile radius, and that's, so that's 2.7 mile radius is uh, not great with math, uh, 5.4 mile diameter around the base of this antenna before that radio signal hits the ground. Okay, and then if you go from a 9 dB antenna to a 3 dB antenna, you go from 5.4 mile radius to just over a half a mile, okay? So you can see how important antenna selection is. Uh, dropping the antenna from, 200, from 900 feet to 250 feet and using the 3 dB antenna will drop the dead zone to just over a tenth of a mile, okay? So it is very important. I'm not exactly sure how you uh, take a 900 foot building and make it a 250 foot building, but if you can, it really, really makes a difference. The other thing is, placement within um, within the building. So we obviously we want, if we're gonna mount the antenna externally, and you don't need to necessarily mount the antenna externally, uh, but it will happen in some situations. You wanna make sure that you clear the roof line and get up above the building roof line here. You can see there's a couple of examples and trees will affect the signal strength, okay? We do see uh, networks perform uh, better in the winter time, well, at least the winter up here, uh, when there's no weeds on the trees. And then you'll get some radios that'll go into Netcon when the weeds um, come back in the spring. You can also see here that the roof will get affected, will actually reflect the signal. A lot of times they're covered with uh, various materials for waterproofing that'll reflect the radio signal. So you want to make sure to get the antenna up and make sure you have a, um, a lower DB antenna. Okay, notice this other antenna is up on a big hill here. Okay, so if you were to put a subscriber down here, it's not going to see any of the radio signal unless you use the right dB antenna. The other thing that's very important for antenna signal is ground plane. And this really confused me when I first started working. This actually creates an electrical field that keeps the radio signal bouncing up to a usable area you can lose 20 to 25% of your signal just by not having these ground planes in place and grounded properly. Okay, so it's very important 
And, you know, like I said, we're talking about two watt radios here. So if you're losing 25% of your signal, then um, you're losing half a watt, just like that. Some of the different antenna types we have, we have a rubber duck antenna, which is our lowest dB antenna. Uh, this comes with all of our subscriber kits. Uh, we also have our phantom antenna, which is uh, made by Laird. This is probably our highest quality antenna. Uh, I recommend everybody have one of these in their kit to keep from having to remote that external antenna, if at all possible. So you can try this guy and see if it works as a last ditch effort before having to put the antenna outdoors. Um, and then we have our 3 dB antenna. This is an indoor outdoor antenna. Just if you're gonna be putting it outside, make sure to seal this, um, this little connector down here. Uh, we have found water and especially areas that freeze and thaw uh, can work down in there. I've unhooked a, quite a few of these RG8 cables and had water just pour out of it. Um, we have a stealth antenna. This is the one AES antenna that doesn't require ground planes. Uh, because it's a dipole antenna. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure why it doesn't, but uh, we do not require ground planes for this and only this antenna. And then we have our 5 dB antenna, uh, which is the largest antenna I would ever use on an AES subscriber, as I, we talked about before. Um, the large dB antennas really uh, do more harm than good, and I'll explain that in a little bit as well. After this, we have our uh, six, seven, and nine dB antennas. I call these the lightsaber antennas because they're big fiberglass antennas and they kind of look like a lightsaber. Um, the, these are, I would only use with IP links. Okay, I would never use anything this big. And remember, this dB antenna has a seven degree beam width coming off of it. So if you're gonna be mounting one of these, you really need to make sure to mount it plumb. If it's leaning seven degrees to the left or to the right, it's going to shoot, it's, the signal on the opposite side of that is never going to come, never going to hit the ground. Okay, so be very careful. And this is an eight foot long antenna. So it is not the easiest thing in the world to mount uh, perfectly plumb. Offset bracket. Uh, this is our AES offset bracket. Please do not use this uh, anywhere with any sort of wind or weather. Uh, we have our hurricane rated mount over here. Uh, we also have tripod mounts mount on flat roofs. Um, we have a bunch of different mounts. There's also an Eve mount that can be purchased. Um, if you're ever interested in it, please reach out and let us know. We have uh, a kit that will allow us to mount the Phantom antenna directly to the top of our subscribers and our EMK kit, which just allows you, it's basically the top of the subscriber can uh, to let you mount the antenna anywhere you'd like internally so that you don't have to, you know, mount it above the ceiling tiles and break out a ladder every time you need to service it. And then we have uh, the phantom antenna mounted on our offset bracket here. The other thing I really want you to avoid is coiled coax. We see this all the time with the, um, I think a lot of this is people don't want to reconnect the ends, don't want to recrimp the ends for fear of screwing that up. Um, and the coiled coax, the only reason I say is to get rid of this coiled coax is um, over 100 feet of cable of the Belden 9913 low loss cable that we'll send you, um, you'll lose 50% of your signal over 100 feet of cable. So you want to keep that cable as short as possible. Um, the ground planes are right here. It's kind of hard to see them in the picture, but they're right here. And for this to be a perfect installation, what we want to do is we just want to move this antenna up a little bit. Um, you don't want any metal within 18 inches of the antenna and to have the aluminum uh, weather head right at the base of this uh, could cause some interference. We have a well-mounted antenna, plumb uh, vertically, uh, no excess coil, all the ground planes are in place, antenna is plumb. Um, the other thing about the ground planes is we really wanna keep them off the wall. That's why we uh, want you to install the offset brackets. Like you can see here, these are mounted off the wall. The problem with this installation right here is it's on the side of the building. And this is actually a, a radar site that was taken by eminent domain back in the Cold War era and then given to, back to the person after the uh, Cold War ended in the 80s. And he now makes a killing putting cell phones and various antennas on it. Uh, but um, they put this on the wrong side of the building. Okay, this is going to have to, the signal is going to have to travel through three feet of concrete with double reinforced rebar. It doesn't work. 
Okay, it's a beautiful installation. <laughs> they did a great job on installing it, but they installed it on the wrong side of the building. Um, so please try to get your antennas up above the building roof line if at all possible. The other thing I see a lot of is the poor cable terminations. Okay, please use the proper tool for the proper job. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, um, go find somebody else uh, who does or look up a YouTube video. There's a lot of great ones out there about how to crimp these cables, um, but this is not going to work very well. Radio can be a little picky, okay? Uh, it, it, you cannot splice radio cable. Um, I have pulled uh, a splice out of um, a, a live system before. Uh, you also want to make sure to use 50 ohm cable for this. Okay, this is what's required for RF, R RG58, RG8, LMR400, LMR600, 800, whatever you prefer. And then all outdoor antennas need a lightning protector as well. To do uh, any testing on your antennas, we recommend a bird watt meter model 43 with a 5E element uh, that will allow you to put, you basically put this in line with your transceiver. So the transceiver is over here. The RG8 cable goes through this side, out this side, and then up to your antenna. And what that'll do is it'll test um, how much reflective power you're getting. And you want less than, if it's two watts out, you want less than 10% of that back. Okay, we found that the analog meter is the only way of testing the power fine enough to really get, so you can recognize 0.2 watts. Okay, if you go with the the digital SWR meters, they're not going to be sensitive enough to um, register that small amount of power. What's wrong with this install? How about a drip, lip, a drip loop on your, uh, on your RF cable? Okay, bending this cable this sharp uh, is going to dramatically reduce the signal strength. Okay, so don't, uh, don't do that. Um, here's one installation I saw. Uh, this is actually from a public school. It's been fixed, don't worry. Uh, but you see the antenna is just uh, laying down here in the top of the radio case. Uh, you can see the double-sided tape fell off. Okay, so obviously this is, is not an installation. This is the worst installation actually I've ever seen. Um, but antenna needs to be mounted vertically. Um, here, this is a little sneaky, but we have a high voltage junction box and then power conduit running right behind here. These are some things that you really should, oh, well, apologize. These are some things you really want to try to avoid when picking a location of where to put an AES radio antenna. Okay, no high power. The, the, um, the power generates, uh, anything that has power running through it generates RF and it can interfere with your radio. Here we have these two antennas are literally bent backwards touching the sprinkler pipe. Okay, I did talk to the guy who did this installation. He claims uh, that the sprinkler pipe was put in after he installed the antennas. Everybody I've told that story to says that's not how construction works. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so whatever the reason, please make sure you're in uh, your antennas. And the other thing is they have power running right behind the antennas, okay? You want to keep it away from metal and away from anything generating power, if at all possible. The other thing is I understand, uh, you know, the technicians out there are responsible for getting stuff done, uh, but that will be your best bet to try to get the installation done and done properly the first time. Real quick, and I know I can hear everybody's uh, eyes roll a little bit when we're talking about mesh routing theory here, but link layer, and I promise there's a point to this, Link layer is the number of hops you are away from your IP link. We always have IP links as link layer zero. Okay, so the first set of subscribers is going to be link layer one. Link layer two hops through link layer one to hop to link layer zero. And then netcon is seven minus the number of good paths. Okay, so if you have uh, two good paths, you have a netcon five. If you have one good path, you have a netcon six, which is fine for Berg applications. You need a netcon five for all fire radios. And how it generally works is that you have your IP link in the middle here and then link layer one around it, link layer two around that. And it kind of works like concentric circles. They aren't always, always this pretty, uh, but it does generally work out like that. 
Now, the thing I want to caution people about is putting too large an antenna on your IP link. We see this all the time where it will shoot the signal because like we talked about how this, it takes time for that signal to get to the ground. It's not going to communicate with the radios nearby. It communicates with link layer two, okay, because it doesn't hit the ground quick enough to get to the link layer one radios. Those of you familiar with AES will recognize the handheld programmer here. And our quality, eights are bad, zeros are good, okay? And what happened here is we had a person, uh, we had a 9 dB antenna, and we kept trying to get him, take it down, take it down, replace it with a lower dB antenna. He thought it would be really funny to take a rubber duck that comes with a subscriber and put it on top of his mask, okay? But the joke's on him because it actually works much better. You can see it went from eights to zeros, which are good, good quality signals. Um, all link layer one. There's some communicating with link layer two out here, just like we thought would happen. If you have too high a, a DB antenna on the top of a tall building, it shoots directly to link layer two and doesn't talk to the radios that are closest to it, which are naturally gonna be the strongest communicators, right? So you can see uh, link layer one, it's shooting out to link layer two land in all of these situations. And when the problem is when these little two watt radios go to talk back, they're not going to be able to talk back that far because they don't have 9 dB antennas on the top of them. Okay. And you're going to see a lot of act delays and things like that and communication that doesn't quite work. But see, we, if we have a lower dB antenna, we're talking to the radios nearby, which makes, um, makes the signals work much better. And then you have true two-way communication with each of the subscribers, okay? So that these guys can talk back. They'll be able to act the signals that they get, the check-ins that they get. And you'll just have a much more reliable uh, way of communicating, okay?